Alex, je n'entends pas le bridge dans la salle, OK? C'est normal? This is an audio check. This is another audio check from the bridge to the room, testing the sound for our connection for the WHO virtual press conference of 11 May 2020. It's Monday, it's a rainy day here in Geneva. And we are hopefully going to get started soon. So please stay with us. Thank you for joining. Thank you for your patience. We'll be back to you shortly.
Hello to everyone. Welcome to a regular press conference on COVID-19 from Geneva headquarters here in a rainy Geneva. Uh, we he hear the rain falling on the, on the roof of uh, the room where we are. So if you hear some noise, that's, uh, that's just the storm that we are going through. Uh, today with us, uh, we have Dr. Te Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Dr. Mike Ryan, and Mr. Uh, Steve Solomon, who is our principal legal officer and may uh, be asked to answer some of your questions. Before I give the floor to Dr. Tedros, just to remind everyone uh, that uh, if you are raising hand to ask a question, you will have to unmute yourself. Uh, we have a interpretation, simultaneous interpretation in six UN languages, plus Portuguese, plus Hindi, and I thank the interpreters for being uh, with us. We also sent you a number of uh, press releases and the information from our regional offices, including about a press conference tomorrow uh, at, um, I think, 11 o'clock uh, from our uh, regional office uh, uh, for Eastern Mediterranean in Cairo. So I will give a floor now to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And thank you all joining today's press conference. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. There have now been more than 4 million cases of COVID-19 across the world. Over the past week, several countries have started lifting stay-at-home orders and other restrictions in a phased way. Countries put these stringent measures in place, sometimes called lockdowns, in response to intense transmission. Many have used the time to ramp up their ability to test, stress, isolate, and care for patients, which is the best way to track the virus, slow the spread, and take pressure of the health systems. The good news is that there has been a great deal of success in slowing the virus and ultimately saving lives. However, such strong measures have come at a cost, and we recognize the serious socioeconomic impact of the lockdowns, which have had a detrimental effect on many people's lives. Therefore, to protect lives and livelihoods, a slow, steady lifting of lockdowns is key to both stimulating economies while also keeping a vigilant eye on the virus so that control measures can be quickly implemented if an upswing in cases is identified. I have previously outlined the six criteria countries need to consider before lifting stay-at-home orders and other restrictions. Over the weekend, further guidance was published that outlines the three key questions countries should ask prior to lifting of lockdowns. First, is the epidemic under control? Second, is the healthcare system able to cope with a resurgence of cases that may arise after relaxing certain measures? Third, is the public health surveillance system able to detect and manage the cases and their contacts and identify a resurgence of cases? These three questions can help determine whether lockdown can be relaxed slowly or not. However, even with three positive answers, releasing lockdowns is both complex and difficult. Over the weekend, we saw signs of the challenges that may lie ahead. In the Republic of Korea, bars and clubs were shut as a confirmed case led to many contacts being traced. In Wuhan, China, the first cluster of cases since their lockdown was lifted was identified. Germany has also reported an increase in cases since an easing of restrictions. Fortunately, 
all three countries have systems in place to detect and respond to a resurgence in cases. Early serological studies reflect that a relatively low percentage of the population has antibodies to COVID-19, which means most of the population is still susceptible to the virus. WHO is working closely with governments to ensure that key public health measures remain in place to deal with the challenge of lifting lockdowns. Until there is a vaccine, the comprehensive package of measures is our most effective set of tools to tackle the virus. In this vein, new guidance was released over the weekend regarding both school and workplaces reopening. On children going back to school, decision makers should reflect on a number of key factors when deciding on whether and how to reopen the schools. First, a clear understanding about current COVID transmission and severity of the virus in children is needed. Second, the epidemiology of COVID-19, where the school is geographically located, needs to be considered. Third, the ability to maintain COVID-19 prevention and control measures within the school setting. When reflecting on the decision to reopen schools, the local government should assess the capacity of the schools to maintain infection prevention and control measures. Last week, I also spoke to the International Labor Organization, ILO, and the International Organization of Employees, IOE, about the reopening of workplaces and how to do this safely. Over the weekend, WHO issued a detailed new workplace guidelines which recommend all places of work carry out a risk assessment for workers' potential exposure to COVID-19. This includes the implementation of measures to prevent the spread of the virus. Workplaces should develop action plans for prevention and mitigation of COVID-19 as part of their overall business plan. The plan should also include measures for protecting health, safety, and security in reopening, closing, and modifying workplaces. Today, so the release of new modeling on HIV by the World Health Organization and UNAIDS. It highlights the importance of taking immediate steps to minimize interruptions in health services and supplies of antiretroviral drugs during the COVID-19 pandemic. The group's worst case scenario, a six month disruption of antiretroviral therapy, suggested that there could be 500,000 extra deaths from AIDS-related illnesses, including from tuberculosis in Sub-Saharan Africa over the next year. This could effectively set the clock back by more than a decade to 2008, when more than 950,000 AIDS deaths were observed in the region. This is an avoidable worst case scenario and not a prediction. This model acts as a wake up call to identify ways to sustain all vital health services. Despite attention being focused on the COVID-19 pandemic, we must still ensure that global supplies of tests and treatments for both HIV and TB reach the countries and communities that need them most. We should save people from both COVID and HIV and other illnesses. Even relatively short-term interruptions to treatment pose a significant threat to a person's health and potential to transmit HIV. COVID-19 has exposed the uneven distribution of life-saving medical equipment across the world. Tomorrow, 
The Tech Access Partnership will be launched to increase local production of essential health technologies like masks and ventilators in developing countries. This new partnership is another great example of solidarity that builds on the solid solidarity flights, solidarity trials, and access to COVID-19 tools accelerator, which all aim to ensure the latest health innovations are reaching those communities that need them most. Only together can we get through this pandemic in national unity and global solidarity. I repeat, only together can we get through this pandemic in national unity and global solidarity. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tetris, for this. We will now open the floor to questions. I will remind journalists that uh, uh, you can ask questions in uh, one of six UN languages, plus Portuguese, uh, plus uh, Hindi, and uh, our interpreters will be willing to translate that. Uh, please, short, concise, and one question. If you go into many questions, we will have to pick ourselves one that we like the most. So uh, we will start with uh, Peter Kenny, a Geneva-based uh, correspondent for a number of uh, South African, I think, media. Peter, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. I'd like to ask my question to Dr. Tedros. Uh, you've spoken about the importance of keeping health workers healthy. Tomorrow is International Nurses' Day. And last week, we had a statement uh, from the International Council of Nurses that 90,000 nurses or health workers have been infected and 260 have died. Do you have accurate uh, statistics on this and can you comment on it, please? Thank you for this very, very important question. Um, so healthcare workers um, who are on the front lines of caring for patients and and um, caring for our loved ones who are infected with COVID-19 are a priority to ensure that they stay healthy. Um, we are, are working with our infection prevention and control specialists across the world to ensure that the guidance that we have out ensures that they are protected when caring for patients. Um, we are looking at um, the number of healthcare worker infections that have been reported globally, um, and there is an alarming number of healthcare worker infections. Um, and in some countries, upwards of 10% of the reported cases are among healthcare workers. What we've done and what we are continuing to do is to better understand where healthcare workers are getting infected, why healthcare workers are getting infected, and how can we ensure that this is reduced and this stops. Um, what we understand from the studies uh, that are being uh, reported and from our uh, teleconferences that we are having with clinicians and with infection control specialists is that many healthcare workers have had contact with a known case that is, in a, that is among a family member, which indicates that many of them have been infected outside of a healthcare facility. Um, some healthcare workers are getting infected inside the healthcare worker facilities and the studies that are coming out are giving us a, a clearer picture of why this may be. First is that um, early on in the pandemic and early on in countries where they're st starting to see initial cases, many of those cases are identified in wards um, that aren't used to infectious diseases. They're not used to respiratory infectious diseases. And in many of those wards, um, long-term care living facilities or geriatric wards, they're not wearing um, contact um, personal protective equipment, um, protecting against respiratory droplets. Once a COVID patient is identified and the appropriate PP is used, then we can prevent transmission. Um, the other uh, reasons why we're seeing healthcare worker infections are extended periods in wards uh, where individuals are working very long shifts. Um, in some situations, they have not had adequate PPE, which includes masks, goggles, face shields, gowns, gloves. Um, in some hospitals, um, there has been a report, reports of um, <coughs> suboptimal hand hygiene. Um, so making sure that healthcare workers use hand hygiene <coughs> is very, very important. Um, what we do also see from these studies is that when healthcare workers do wear uh, appropriate PPE, 
which includes um, respiratory protecting against respiratory droplets um, and contact transmission, and in situations where aerosol generating procedures are conducted and there's airborne precautions are necessary, we're not seeing that transmission take place. So that is really critical. But um, we are constantly looking at the literature that is coming out to better understand how we can better protect healthcare workers. We can ensure that their shifts are shorter, that they have adequate rest periods, that we look out for their mental health and their well being, and that they have adequate supplies of personal protective equipment. If I could just add, when we define uh, healthcare worker, I mean, we, we sometimes imagine that's healthcare workers working in very sophisticated tertiary facilities. Uh, a lot of healthcare workers have been affected in the front lines and long term care facilities as well, and in primary healthcare to general practitioners and others. So, the, 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 the protecting workers who work in COVID 19 isolation units and intensive care can work extremely well if they have the right equipment and training. But we also have to look at the risk management for those other frontline workers who may come into contact with COVID-19 uh, cases to ensure that they're adequately protected too. So it's a complex issue and uh, the definition of health worker in this case is very broad. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, answer. Uh, before we go to the next question, just to remind that uh, we are operating with Zoom, so people wanting to listen Hindi interpretation will have to go to settings and choose Japanese language. And those who would like to listen in Arabic, they have to choose Korean language. Uh, next question, uh, Nicola Smith uh, from Telegraph. Nicola. Uh, Nicola, Hi. Yes. can you hear me? Yes, it's okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for the question. It's on the subject of Taiwan's invitation to the WHO, uh, sorry, the WHA as an observer, uh, to Dr. Tedros. Last week, the WHO implied that a sticking point was based in UN resolutions that recognize only representatives of the PRC can represent China at the WHA. However, Taiwan's foreign ministry and Taiwanese lawyers say that the resolutions only address the question of China's representation and not the separate issue of Taiwan's attendance. Given that, that Beijing's one China pr principle is not international law and not universally recognized, critics of the WHO and, do and the Director um, <clears throat> General's reluctance to invite Taiwan say that you're making a political call if you fall into line with Beijing's views on the issue. How would you respond to that? Uh, th thank you, and thank you, thank you for the question. There are five points I'd like to make to respond to that question. First, the Secretariat works within the framework of rules and policies decided by the 194 member states of WHO. These include the decision you mentioned, the, the decision by WHO member states made 49 years ago. That still applies where the Health Assembly decided that the People's Republic of China is the, and I'm quoting here, is the only legitimate representative of China to the World Health Organization, close quote, and further decided, uh, and I'm quoting again, quote, to expel the representatives of Chiang Kai-shek from the place which they unlawfully occupy at the World Health Organization, close quote. Second point is WHO experts turning to the issue of technical work. WHO experts recognize and have publicly said here at these press conferences and, other, uh, and otherwise that Taiwanese health authorities have mounted a very successful response to the outbreak and have good experience to offer. Their technical contributions to WHO's COVID response expert processes, including three WHO networks, clinical network, the infection prevention and control network, and recently the vaccine network. Their work on the, uh, with the WHO Global Research and Innovation Forum, where they sent two experts, uh, and their IHR EIS system connectivity, uh, all uh, are uh, examples of where they have contributed significantly and their contributions there are appreciated. Third, 
WHO is premised on the principle that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being, without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. This is in the WHO in Constitution. It's part of our DNA as an organization. Fourth, the DG, the Director General, is the Secretary of the Health Assembly, according to the Constitution. Member states, and only member states, determine the policies of the organization at those meetings, make the final decision on what they will discuss, and they themselves determine who attends as observers. To put it crisply, Director Generals only extend invitations when it's clear that member states support doing so, that, de that Director Generals have a mandate, a basis, to do so. So, for example, the Holy See was invited by the then Director General in 1949 when the Health Assembly was held in Rome. Then in 1950, the ICRC was invited, and then in successive years, a number of examples, the IFRC, the Global Fund, Gavi, among a few others. For all of these, for all of these, member state support was very clear. And from 2009 to 2016, Taiwan was invited by the then Director General as an observer at the Health Assembly as Chinese Taipei on the same basis. Then too, member state support was clear. It was clear then because a diplomatically agreeable solution had been found and member states supported that solution. Therefore, on that basis, the then Director General could and did extend an invitation. Today, however, the situation is not the same. Instead of clear support, there are divergent views among member states and no basis, therefore no mandate, for the DG to extend an invitation. Fifth and final point, a practical one. A proposal has been made by 13 member states now that the assembly itself make a decision on an invitation. That is procedurally how it is supposed to work under the Constitution. All 194 member states can consider the issue collectively in accordance with the rules of procedure. Member states can also choose to look for a diplomatically agreeable solution for handling this issue. They have done so many times in the past, working cooperatively together. Success on that depends on political will and political engagement which underscores the point that this is a political issue that is properly in the hands of member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Solomon, for this explanation. Uh, we will now go to Kamran Kasimov uh, from Azerbaijani TV, Real TV. Kamran, unmute yourself if possible, please. Hello, do we have Kamran? Kasimov online? Uh, I think. Uh, well, we may come back to Kamran uh, later. Uh, let's try with Imogen from BBC. Imogen? Hi, Tarek. Thanks for taking my question. Um, it's about the. Uh, you can hear me, yeah? Yes. Okay. It's about uh, the guidance for reopening of schools and workplaces, schools in particular. At the opening, Dr. Tedros said schools need to have a, a clear understanding of uh, virus transmission in relation to children and the extent of how the virus affects children. Um, unless I've missed something, we don't understand that yet. So is the implication that schools shouldn't reopen? So I can start uh, with that and, and perhaps Mike or DG would like to supplement. So in the considerations for, for reopening or adjusting um, any of the, of, of the measures is based on our understanding of this virus and how this virus behaves. Um, one of the considerations for schools where children are is our understanding of, of the virus in, in children. And that is something we are learning more and more about every single day. 
Um, we've talked about this at some of the pressers previously um, about our understanding of the reports of cases among children um, by countries, and that ranges between one and 5% of the reported cases by country. Um, we're trying to understand um, why there is a low attack rate in the children and why a, a smaller proportion of children are being reported among the total number of cases being reported. And we're trying to understand um, transmission in children. Um, from the available studies that we have, uh, looking at household transmission, and these are very detailed studies that follow all of the people in the household, and they test all of those people in the households. Um, we've seen transmission from adults to children, uh, primarily from adults to children. There have been some instances of transmission the other way around, from children to adults, but to a much lesser extent. Um, there are some seroepidemiologic studies that are currently underway, that are looking at the extent of infection um, as measured by antibody level. So this is measuring past infection among children. Um, we have very few of these studies available yet. Um, so we don't know if children are being infected and we're missing them through the current surveillance systems. We do know with regards to severity that the majority, the vast majority of children who are reported to be infected with COVID-19, that they experience a mild disease although there are a small number of children that have had severe disease, critical disease, and some children have died. Um, in terms of making the decisions about opening schools, it's very important to understand um, the virus circulation in the area of where the schools are. Uh, what does it look like? Is there intense transmission in that geographic area? Is it not? Um, are the schools able to um, practice physical distancing within the school system itself? Are there different ways that they can set up the, the classroom, for example, or the playtime or lunchtime so that they can keep children um, physically separate? We know that there are challenges with that for younger children versus older children. There's a lot of considerations that need to be taken into account when deciding whether and how to open schools. It's not just a matter of if they should open, it's how they should open. And there's a lot of um, detrimental effects to children who are not in school. And these are well known. We are working very closely with our counterparts at, at UNICEF, and we're very grateful to be working with them to really understand the full impact of children not being in school. Um, so there are a lot of considerations that need to take place. The DG has highlighted a few considerations, but the guidance itself has a lot more in there. And in fact, in the guidance itself, there are a lot of questions um, that decision makers need to evaluate to, to see how they can safely op reopen schools. Uh, let's try one more time uh, to get Kamran Kasimov from uh, Azerbaijan. Kamran? Do you hear me? Yes. Hello, greetings from Azerbaijan, from Real TV. Uh, I want to say that the uh, first modular hospital was opened at last week in Azerbaijan under the leadership of the President of Azerbaijan Republic. And Dr. Tedros, every time I appreciate the role of Azerbaijan uh, struggle against the coronavirus. But uh, from uh, 9th, 9th of May, we have uh, not, we have uh, uh, very bad uh, satisf uh, information, satisfactory. For example, 9 of uh, May, number of inf infected people was 143, and 10th of May, the number was uh, 97. Uh, is this the signal of the second wave for our country, please? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, 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 I uh, can't relate my figures to yours right now, but uh, Azerbaijan uh, has had a, a relatively uh, low number of cases, but the number of cases has grown steadily. So uh, I think it's difficult to s distinguish between first wave, second waves, and uh, Azerbaijan is still very much in a, in, a, in a risky position, like many other countries in, <clears throat> in Central Asia, with possibility of increasing cases. Um, you may see, and sometimes people see this as waves, you see a small number of cases beginning and then it gradually and slowly builds and then there's a point at which things accelerate. We've seen that in many, many, many countries. Uh, that would not be the classic second wave that other countries now who've had large numbers of cases may be facing in weeks to months' time. So uh, certainly Azerbaijan uh, needs to be very wary and very alert right now in terms of the the incidence of cases and ensuring that things don't take off in a very extreme way. 
Uh, with regard to the future of the pandemic and epidemics around the world, um, many countries now have a sustained falling in the number of cases and the number of deaths. Uh, and as we enter into a, a low transmission period, and the Director General has alluded to it in his speech, those countries who are exiting uh, more stringent public health and social measures or so-called lockdowns uh, will do better uh, and may avoid major second waves if they can shut down early tr uh, transmission early in clusters that are identified, much like Korea has done or is doing with regard to its latest clusters of infection. What we would hope is that countries applying strong public health surveillance with sustained uh, physical distancing and hygiene measures amongst populations with, a, with an alert and an educated population capable of being able to, 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 to take control of their own risks, but also a strong public health system capable of detecting and tracing and isolating, uh, we may avoid uh, a major second wave. But if disease persists in countries at a low level without the capacity to uh, investigate clusters, identify clusters, then there is always the risk that the disease will take off again, particularly uh, where we have uh, large groups of people together in major cities and refugee camps and very other places where people don't have the possibility of large-scale social or physical distancing. So I think uh, now we're seeing some hope as many countries exit these uh, so-called lockdowns, and this is good, it allows economic life to return. But extreme vigilance is required, and not just vigilance. Uh, many countries, as the DG has said, have made very systematic investments in building up their public health capacities uh, during the lockdowns. Others have not. And we need every country now to put in place the necessary public health measures or the public health surveillance in order to be able to at least have a chance of avoiding uh, larger second waves later. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is uh, from uh, China Radio, and that's uh, Zhang uh, Yingao. Uh, uh, Mr. Yingao, can you hear us? Hello. Yes. Uh, 呃 同时，世界卫生组织也将2020年定为国际护士和助产士年。那么今年的新冠肺炎疫情的发生，令2020的国际护士节更加特殊和庄重。值此之际，想请问谭德赛博士，您对全世界勇敢的护士们有怎样的
So all our respect and appreciation, not only respect and appreciation, actually our greatest respect and appreciation from WHO to all nurses. Uh, on the uh, year of the nursing, of course, as you said, uh, 2020 is the year of the nurse and the midwife. And we have been preparing to uh, celebrate it in a big way. Uh, but unfortunately, because of COVID, um, especially during the assembly, which is going to be virtual, uh, we will not be able uh, to celebrate it as we uh, planned. Uh, of course, still uh, virtually celebrating it uh, will be very important. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a consensus from the Nursing Association and the Midwifery Association that the, um, the year of the nurse and the midwife uh, be postponed to 2021. That's one. But at the same time, instead of having the year of the nurse and the midwife in 2020 or 2021, uh, the other consensus is to have the 2020 as the decade of the nurse and the midwife. Um, and that fits very well with what I said earlier, uh, that celebrating our nurses and midwives should actually be every uh, single single day and then the celebration is not just uh, celebration for the sake of celebration uh, it's not just to pay tribute to them it's also um, uh, to uh, recognize their important role in universal health coverage in achieving universal health coverage and uh, to invest in, in universal health coverage and to use the nurses, the midwives, and other frontline health workers to achieve universal health coverage. But the numbers we have, if you take nurses, for instance, we have a gap of uh, uh, six million uh, annual, uh, six million globally. And it also means when we say the, the year or the decade of the nurse or the midwife, uh, feeling, feeling the gap in order to achieve the UHC. So for WHO, celebrating nurses and midwives is also preparing ourselves to um, achieve our commitment or universal health coverage and, and, and health for all. It's not just recognizing nurses and midwives, but um, using this opportunity and using the sacrifice, the commitment of the nurses uh, to achieve universal health coverage, to achieve uh, health uh, for all. Thank you very much. Tadris, the next question uh, is Financial Times. Camila. Camila, please go ahead if you uh, hear us. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, there have been some reports recently of people suffering for, from symptoms for many weeks, um, up to six or even more, um, which can get more or less severe in waves. I wonder if that's something that the WHO is aware of um, and how common you think it might be. So thanks for the question. The question was um, if we are aware of individuals who are experiencing symptoms for long periods of time and in, and in waves. Um, we are, are working with our clinical network um, and we're working, we're looking at the literature to really understand how disease progresses. Um, a lot of this requires, we, we need to ensure that people who are experiencing symptoms are tested so that we know that these symptoms are associated with COVID-19 or not. Um, you have to remember that in the Northern Hemisphere, we've just finished a flu season. Um, and there are many circulating viruses that can cause flu or flu-like symptoms. Um, and so what we're trying to do is get a clear picture of what um, disease looks like. Um, when people start to feel unwell, what do those symptoms look like? Um, how many days does it take them to develop a fever if they don't start with a fever? Uh, for those who start out a little bit unwell, how many progress to pneumonia um, that might not need hospital? How many people then progress to even more severe disease? And so um, 
what we understand is um, there's, a, there's a large number of symptoms that um, people are exhibiting, including fever, including dry cough, cough, including shortness of breath. You've heard of other symptoms, your people have a loss of smell or a loss of taste. Um, and there's more symptoms that are being reported. What's very important for us and what we're working with um, countries and hospitals is to have a standardized data collection so that from some of the patients or, or, or a proportion of the patients, we have a robust set of information. Um, we are working with the United Kingdom, for example, um, and this group called ISARIC. It's the International Severe Acute Respiratory Infection Consortium. This is just one of many, which is have, using a standardized data collection form and collecting uh, symptoms from tens of thousands of patients. Um, and that is very helpful for us to get that picture. From the data that we have from countries, um, we still are seeing about 40% of patients who are exhibiting mild disease um, and will recover just fine. We have another 40% that are exhibiting more moderate symptoms, which would include pneumonia, but not, in, not needing uh, hospitalization or respiratory support. We see a further 15% that are exhibiting severe disease and needing respiratory support and hospitalization, and another 5% that are critical, um, requiring ICU and, and more and ventilatory support. Um, we are trying to get a picture of that's consistent across all countries and from the data that we've seen that is a fairly consistent picture um, and so that's important that helps us for planning purposes it helps us get hospitals ready to know how to care for patients and what they can what types of supplies that they may need um, but it still is early days um, you, you've, you've heard us say that a lot we're learning every day more and more about this virus and the diseases that it causes and if it's different for young people or old people or people with underlying conditions and so as that picture becomes more and more clear we'll be able to have a more clear answer yeah, and uh, with regard to your uh, specific question regarding this longer syndrome. Certainly there have been uh, some reported cases of uh, putative relapses of people who've fallen sick uh, again and a lot of work is going on to see whether people have been reinfected or whether it's just a, a chronic part of a condition. Uh, <clears throat> the people who leave hospital are free of the virus, they're usually testing negative before they're, they depart hospital, but I think what we have to remember is many people who've been hospitalized have experienced severe disease. And while they may be free of the virus and no longer infectious, uh, many are experiencing longer term issues with, with energy, they've been through the, literally been through the wars, many of them in very difficult circumstances. Some have had uh, impacts on their respiratory system, their cardiovascular system, their liver, their kidney function and others. So people could remain quite frail, uh, quite uh, without energy and, 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 and struggle to get back to full health. So the, we have to separate here what is a, a long struggle to get back to full health from what might be uh, a continued uh, COVID-19 syndrome where you have uh, uh, persistent virus. And the evidence thus far is that there is very little evidence to suggest that there are people who are persistently uh, suffering from COVID-19. Although when you see the data from the hospitals and the length of admission, it is taking many people a very long time to recover in a hospital environment. <clears throat> and we should expect that when people are discharged, that recovery continues and uh, people don't necessarily just bounce back to full health. Although when they are discharged from hospital, it is safe for them to return uh, for themselves and their families. Next question comes from uh, Brazil. Uh, Ana Pinto from uh, Pola de Sao Paulo. Ana. Anna, can you, hi, can you hear hi, us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, nice. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Maria. Dr. Maria, last week you mentioned epidemiologic studies with uh, serologic tests in several countries. I'd like to know how high is the prevalence found in those studies? And uh, as far as the percentage uh, of people who, who had contact, contact with the virus is below uh, the level of the so-called herd immunology, if having a higher prevalence protects more than, than having a lower one, uh, given a certain population. There is, for instance, a country or a region with 30% of the population that already have been infected. Is, is this population more, more protected 
to tackle a second wave than another with, uh, let's say, just 5% of prevalence? Thank you very much. So thank you for, thank you for the question. Um, there are a large number of countries that are conducting these seroepidemiologic studies. Um, we are tracking them, and there's more than 90 studies that are underway. Um, some of the results of the early studies are, are now starting to be published. Um, I say published, uh, one of them has come out in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, there are a few others that we've seen as preprints, which means they haven't undergone the full review, and a number have also released results as press releases. I say this because it's important um, because we aren't able to critically evaluate all of these studies yet. Um, what is interesting from the studies that are coming out um, is that uh, many of them across a number of countries in Europe, in the United States, um, in Asia, have found a very low proportion of the people that have been tested um, have evidence of antibodies as measured by these serologic tests. Um, and there, the range is, is between 1 and 10 percent. It depends on the study. It depends on the assay that was used. Um, there are a couple of studies. I haven't seen the full studies. I haven't, we haven't evaluated them. That suggests it's a little bit higher, uh, maybe 14, 15 percent. But we haven't seen the full studies. Um, and again, I say that because we need to understand which populations were studied, which serologic assays were used, so that we could really understand what the results mean. Having said that, um, there seems to be a consistent pattern so far that a low proportion of people have these antibodies. And that is important, as you mentioned, because you mentioned this word herd immunity, um, which is normally a phrase that's used when you think about vaccination. And you think, what amount of the population needs to have uh, an immunity to be able to protect the rest of the population? Um, and uh, that level, we don't know exactly what that level needs to be for COVID-19, um, but it certainly needs to be higher than, than what we're seeing in some of these sero, sero prevalent studies. Um, what the sero epidemiologic studies indicate to us is that there's a large proportion of the population that remains susceptible. And that's important when you think about what may happen in, in subsequent waves or what may happen as a potential resurgence. Um, and so we have a long way to go with this virus because the virus has more people that can be infected. Having said that, we have the tools in our toolbox to be able to prevent this virus from taking off again. And we know that that's about finding the virus, finding people with the virus, isolating them, caring for them um, appropriately depending on their symptoms, um, making sure that we find all contacts, we trace those contacts, quarantine them so that they don't have the opportunity to transmit further, make sure our population is fully engaged so that they know how they can protect themselves and how they can protect others. So we do have tools in our, in our, um, at our disposal to be able to prevent transmission from happening further. Um, and seroepidemiology is one of the ways in which we are using to help us understand how we move forward through this pandemic. Yeah, and uh, again, I'm just reiterating that herd immunity, um, and again, a term taken sometimes from veterinary <clears throat> um, epidemiology where people are concerned in animal husbandry with the overall health of the herd and an individual animal in that sense doesn't matter uh, from the perspective of the brutal economics of that, those decision making. Uh, humans uh, are not herds uh, and as such the concept of herd immunity is generally reserved for <clears throat> calculating how many people would need to be vaccinated in a population in order to generate that same effect. So I think we need to be really careful when, when we use um, terms in this way around natural infections in humans, because we can reach, it, can, it can lead to a very brutal arithmetic, uh, which does not put people <clears throat> and life and suffering uh, at the center of that equation. Um, what also does concern me in this narrative is that there was an assumption as this disease spread around the world that we're really just seeing the severe cases and the, and the, the, the difficult cases. And when the seroepidemiology comes, it will demonstrate that most of the people have been infected and this will all be over, we'll go back to normal business. Well, the preliminary results from the seroepidemiologic studies is showing the opposite. It's showing that the proportion of people with significant clinical illness is actually a higher proportion of all those who've been infected because the number of people infected in the total population is probably much lower than we expected. 
Uh, and as Maria said, that means we have a long way to go. And it means, as the Director General has been saying for months, this is a serious disease. This is public enemy number one. We have been saying it over and over and over and over again. Uh, and we really do need to now, now step back and sort of recalculate this as a mild illness and, and effectively make the same mistakes we made the first time round in terms of not taking uh, this seriously and not putting in place the necessary measures. We have a second chance now as a society to put in place the necessary public health interventions, to put in place the necessary community supports, to support our vulnerable populations, be they in long-term care facilities or be they in refugee camps. No one is safe until everyone is safe. <clears throat> and again, when we look at the, the epidemic around the world and we see that in some countries over half of the cases have occurred in long-term care facilities or workers in those facilities. Uh, you know, we need to look at these hotspots, at these really, really terrible situations in which we either haven't properly shielded pop, uh, uh, people in those situations or protected them. Uh, so I do think uh, this idea that, well, maybe countries who've had lax measures and haven't done anything will all of a sudden magically reach some herd immunity and, and so what if we lose a few old people along the way? I mean, th th this is a really dangerous, dangerous calculation. Uh, and not one I believe most member states are willing to, 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 to make <clears throat> that arithmetic. Member states, uh, responsible member states, will look at all their population. They value every member of their society and they try to do everything possible to protect health while at the same time, obviously, protecting society, protecting economy and other things. We need to get our priorities right as we enter the next phase of this fight. Um, next question is coming from uh, Georgia, ePress uh, Georgia, and we have online Konstantin Lonatamishvili. Konstantin, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, do we have Konstantin from Georgia? If you can just uh, press the button to unmute, unmute yourself. Hello, can, we, can, can you hear us now? Uh, okay, we will have to go to a uh, next uh, journalist. It's really, sorry, we couldn't hear. Uh, Konstantin, so we go to Emma, Emma Farge from Reuters. Emma? You also need to... Yes. Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about South Korea and Germany and other countries experiencing um, a resurgence in new infections. Um, the timing of this, I think, is interesting because it's happening just as they're beginning to eat lockdowns. And, and Mike Ryan, you used that lovely metaphor of looking through a telescope in space. And in fact, we should not see the impact of those measures for another two weeks. So how can you explain the timing of this? And what is your message to those countries experiencing the resurgence? Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I think most uh, people observing around the world have, have also seen that in advance of the lifting of measures, social mobility has actually increased as well before in anticipation. So uh, it could well be that people were, were already beginning to move <clears throat> before the, the actual restrictions were lifted. But I, I think the, the tell and the telling thing here is that, and it's really important, and countries like Germany and countries uh, like Korea shouldn't be criticized for looking, for finding, for being alert, for, for uh, being ready and reacting quickly and engaging quickly to investigate, to isolate, to trace and to track, because that's what we've been saying. The virus is still here. So even as you lift lockdowns, even in low incident situations, even in a place like Korea, where the incidents or the number of cases per day had dropped to a very low level, they didn't let their guard down. They knew the virus is still here. And the virus is still here a lot more in other countries. So the warning to everyone is, as <clears throat> restrictions are lifted, people will mix more. That is undoubted, and, it, and, and they will maintain physical distance, and they will do other things, but the risk of transmission will potentially go up. The question is, can we reach a point where we have strong public health measures in place, where we can investigate clusters of cases, 
and suppress those clusters without going back to the intense transmission patterns of before. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So we hope and we have faith that Germany, Korea and other countries <clears throat> will be able to uh, suppress the clusters they're having. And in some cases, and maybe at a sub-national level, they may have to impose some specific measures that are targeted at reducing particular types of transmission. Um, and again, we've seen a situation where people come together in a crowded environment uh, is probably the riskiest uh, situation that we face, especially uh, if there still is disease present at uh, country level. So there's a lot to be done, but uh, it's really important that we hold up uh, examples of countries who are willing to open their eyes and willing to keep their eyes open. Uh, shutting your eyes and, uh, and, and trying to drive through this blind <clears throat> is about as uh, silly an equation as I've seen. Uh, and I'm really concerned that certain countries are setting themselves up for some seriously blind driving over the next few months. If I could just add something uh, short to say that, um, you know, you said what can we say to these countries? It's just, you know, stay strong, stay vigilant, uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing, be open, be transparent as you are. And as Mike said, this isn't a, this isn't a punishment, you know, for, for reporting this. We shouldn't be punishing countries for reporting this. We should be saying this is what we need to be doing and we need to be learning from each other. Um, every country, every person has something to teach us about this virus and we need to learn from each other. We need to be humble that this virus is smart, um, that this virus finds those cracks, this virus has plenty of place to move. And if we take a slow and a staggered and a data-driven approach to adjusting our measures, whether the adjustment is lifting the measures or the adjustment is intensifying them again, um, it's really important that it's a data-driven approach. Um, and that's what we're seeing in these countries. They are looking at different measures. They're looking at different par parameters, like the reproduction number, for example, at the percent positive that are coming back from their tests. Um, and they're, they are humble in this, and they're, they're showing that they can find cases again, but they're taking that same aggressive approach that they did the first time. And they will show us that they can bring this under control. So. Um, keeping the public informed about what is happening as these measures get lifted and if they have to be intensified again is really critical mm -hmm. because uh, people are growing tired, we understand, but we need people to stay with us, you know, to really understand that this is gonna take some time to work through. And we may not get this right exactly at the first time. We may have to implement, we may have to lift, we may have to adjust, um, but we will get through this. Um, and so just stay vigilant, stay strong, be open, be transparent, uh, be aggressive, and, um, and you will get through this. Thanks. Maybe last question uh, that we can take for today, and that would be uh, Simon Ateba from uh, Today News Africa. Uh, Simon? Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, this is Simon Ateba from Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Uh, I wanted Dr. Tedros to comment a little bit more on the latest projection that up to half a million uh, HIV, additional HIV death could be recorded, recorded in sub-Saharan Africa as a result of COVID-19 disruption. Is there anything that we can do, any urgent thing that we need to do right now? Thank you. I can begin, sir. Um, I think, uh, <clears throat> again, the, the DG did say in his speech that this is a worst case scenario. And what he's laying out for people is a future scenario if we don't fix the things that need to be fixed. And this is really about the supply chains for drugs and the basic primary health care and the basic services available to people living with HIV. I think we've all seen the great success, the great partnership that has led to a dramatic fall in HIV positivity and AIDS-related deaths in Africa over the last number of years, a partnership that's, that's existed with countries, from, with support from external countries. The Director General uh, himself, uh, while in Ethiopia, worked very closely with PEPFAR and the US government and others uh, to reduce the scourge of HIV and AIDS and so many other donors uh, from around the world. We don't want to lose those gains, and I'm sure nobody wants to lose those gains. And uh, we need to work together to ensure that we have the drugs. And 
when we, we know where the people are, we've got to connect people with the therapy, we've got to reconnect people with services, and we've got to ensure that people don't lose access to services. The Director General has been saying this for months. It's not just about COVID-19, it's about the, the core health system must be preserved. And we must now move to ensure that primary and essential health services are maintained. And there is nothing more essential than ensuring that someone with HIV has access to the appropriate therapy uh, that we've all worked so hard for decades to put in place. Thank you. I think uh, we can conclude uh, this press briefing with this question from Simon Ateba. Uh, audio file will be sent out uh, shortly and transcript will be available tomorrow. Just to remind you that uh, two of our regional offices will have a press briefing tomorrow. Uh, WHO Regional Office for Eastern Mediterranean as well as WHO Regional Office for Americas and those uh, advisories will be sent to you. I wish everyone a very nice rest of the day or evening. Okay, thank you also from my side and uh, see you on Wednesday. Thank you, Tariq.